Um, I uh, did start out as a coral reef biologist and paleontologist, and like most uh, sort of egotistical uh, scientists interested in a very small thing, never really thought about um, a broader contribution to society. Um, I worked on coral reefs in Jamaica, it's where Nancy and I met, and, and um, it was this wonderful paradise and then between the time I was an assistant professor and the time I became a full professor at Johns Hopkins, 10 years, everything that I had ever studied disappeared. And then as I began to realize that, um, not only that, but the, the seagrass meadows that I studied throughout the entire Caribbean, uh, the turtles that lived in the turtle grass, and I did my thesis on that and I never saw a turtle in the turtle grass and four years of field work. It began to sink in that there were really more profound issues to work on than what I had started out to do and I started to make this slow shift into the environment. And then this says restart now. <laughs> Remind me in 10 minutes. Is it gonna work? I hope so. It looks like it, it looks like it, okay. And you stole that, yes, thank you. Okay, so, um, so this book, Breakpoint, happened because as I did, and, and I have to say that along the way I, I worked on overfishing, I published a paper with a whole bunch of people about overfishing and how the problems of today had a long and deep history, and that paper sort of changed my life and made me a huge number of enemies in the fishery science field, a field with zero successes in 100 years. Um, they didn't like me very much. And, and as I went around talking about all the horrible things that had happened in the ocean, actually Nancy too, we became known as Doctors Doom and Gloom uh, on the lecture circuit. And, um, and I guess it was fun. Uh, there were a lot of threats along the way, no pipe bombs, but there was a website actually dedicated to my inanity and lying about the environment, which I suppose is a badge of honor. But you, you, you begin to realize that, first of all, doom and gloom isn't going to save the world. Um, that's a line from Nancy. Um, and that also, um, there are glimmers of hope out there. And so, but it's really bad at the same time. And so this book is a attempt to come to grips with and to write about and talk about the fact that the sky really is falling now, not some time in the distant future, but also at the same time that there's a lot, a whole lot, that we can still do about it if we're willing and have the energy and the conviction. I firm fervently believe that the greatest mistake, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a noble and amazing group of heroic scientists who have told us about climate change and what's happening and, and, and how we really need to be aware. I fervently believe that they made a fundamental error and the so-called Sustainable Biosphere Initiative did the same damn thing. Talking about how horrible the world was gonna be in 2100 when we'll all be dead. It just, you know, it's soccer practice and, 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 and you know, a raise and everything else in the world is more important that, to the average person than what's gonna happen in 2100. And, and what really always bothered me about that is that it was already obvious quite a while ago that climate change was already now. And so now finally, you must have read in whatever newspaper or TV news you, you look at, that the IPCC has come out and said, holy shit, it's going to be really bad in 2040. And that's only 22 years from now. And I guess all I want to say is, duh, uh, but thank God you're saying it, because these people are really important. And, and it's really good to know that um, we're finally starting to talk about time scales that are really relevant and are going to affect all of us in this room, no matter how old we are. That, by the way, is what used to be a large part of the Mississippi Delta, which is drowned. 
Okay, now, it's not working. See, restart now. Help. Are we working? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so the book actually didn't start out in the beginning as all this stuff I just told you. Um, my co-author, who's a, a journalist, came to me uh, after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and said he wanted to write a book about the oil spill. And I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of because there'll be 15 books. You're sort of slow, Steve. I don't think you'll be the first one. <laughs> and besides, the Deepwater, that oil spill is sort of a minor league part of what's really long with the, wrong with the Gulf of Mexico. If you want to really understand what's wrong with the Gulf of Mexico, you got to go up to North Dakota and look at the dams, and you got to go to Iowa and look at the cornfields to understand that the delta is sinking because of sediment starvation and nutrient pollution and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, we, he, I convinced him, and we got together, and we did this crazy thing. And the book has three parts. Um, the first is a road trip from the heartland to the Gulf, which I got to tell you was one of the most fun things I ever did in my life. Um, you know, we could have written this book. He's this fancy journalist from California. And I'm this, you know, whatever I am in New York. And, and we all know that the great in-between doesn't think a whole lot of California or New York. Um, so what we thought was we'll just go and ask the people who are being affected by all these things and learn from them and have a little bit of humility um, because, you know, most environmental books are written from a desk in an Ivy League university or something. So we made this trip and we spent a ton of time in Iowa, more time than I ever, ever thought I'd spend in Iowa. And then in Louisiana, and I got to admit, I liked Louisiana a whole lot more because the delta of the Mississippi River is one of the most culturally exciting and interesting places I have ever, ever been in my life. So we made this trip, and we sort of took notes and listened to the people who are being affected by the stuff I'm going to talk about to find out what they thought. And then we, in the second part of the book, we dig into the science and the consequences of the two things that stood out as the scariest things in the heartland of the US, industrial agriculture and sea level rise and, and then also extreme weather, and then sort of end up with talking about. Now, I'm not gonna go through the whole book, obviously, um, but what I am gonna do is summarize some of the most important things we learned, and I'm gonna do it in terms of identifying the kinds of things that are easily fixable if we cared, the things that are a whole lot scarier, but we can adapt and do pretty well, and then the stuff which is downright catastrophic and we better just admit it and get on with it so that we can do a better job. So as I, spent, I said, I spent a lot of time in Iowa, and that's Iowa, and if you're just going across the country like when I retired at Scripps, I'm the only faculty member at Scripps who said goodbye to paradisical La Jolla, California on the Pacific Ocean and drove to Maine to freeze to death because I thought, it was, I thought it was nicer. And I went through Iowa really fast in three hours at about 80 miles an hour. And that is all you see. Two thirds of that throughout the entire Corn Belt is genetically modified organisms, corn, soy, and cotton. And I'm going to tell you right at the start, I am not anti-GMO. I think GMO is great for the right stuff. But what this GMO crop is, is it'll die if it doesn't um, get planted along with a whole lot of poison and fertilizer and all sorts of stuff, and it's a catastrophe. In fact, the product of this great so-called agricultural success story is all of this. That's the poison, Roundup, 20 Olympic swimming pools full of that poison are dumped on Midwestern fields every year. 20 Olympic swimming pools full. California is working to declare it a carcinogen. There's a lot of debate about how really, really bad it is in its pure form, but when you mix it with a whole lot of other stuff, you know you've got a cocktail, and that great agriculture, dependent on this poison, corn and soy, 
brings us a lot of benefits like soil erosion. Iowa is losing a centimeter a year, which means it'll be gone in less than a century. Uh, drainage of the, all that excess fertilizer, the nitrogen, which goes out these little things into creeks, into rivers, into the Mississippi River, into the Gulf of Mexico, where it causes the dust zone. Super weeds, this is actually my favorite. Um, for all of us who read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, published in 1962, we know that she told us that if you dump a lot of poison on a biological system to get rid of something, evolution is a powerful thing and resistance will evolve and you'll be in more trouble than when you started. And so think of those 20 Olympic swimming pools of Roundup poison and this is what you get super weeds. These things are only a few weeks old and they sort of screw up fields and people lose a lot of money and there are now a whole lot of species of super weeds and more and more are appearing and they're a huge, huge problem. And then this is the scariest thing of all. This is Lake Erie. That's a big place, right? Um, sort of like the size of New Jersey. Um, and all of this is color enhanced algal bloom. And a lot of this is cyanobacterial algal bloom. And cyanobacteria make a poison, which is strangely enough called cyanotoxin. And cyanotoxin, you can't get it out of the water by boiling it. Uh, Iowa water companies are spending over $1,000 a person a year to purify water that is poisoned with this stuff. The city of Toledo down here, someplace, shut down its water supply about five years ago because there was a bloom. And this stuff, and the UN, the US EPA does not say what levels are dangerous, but the UN does. And um, funny, we don't. And um, reservoirs all through the Midwest, all down here, have been sampled in detail. And I hate bottled water, but I drink bottled water in the Midwest because most of these reservoirs have higher than you would like to know levels of cyanotoxin in them. And they can kill you and do brain damage and do all sorts of stuff, and they're just really bad. Okay, now what do we get for that, right? So we've made this deal with the devil. We're destroying our topsoil. We're poisoning ourselves. Our drinking water stinks. And what do we get? We get ethanol, which we don't need which we make pretty inefficiently from corn. We get hogs. We make a lot of money for the hogs. The one wonderful farmer who helped us and is the subject of the first chapter of our book, he had one book in his house, The Lonely Planet Guide to Russia, because he's on the hog board and the Russians buy our pork, as do the Chinese, because it's very, very high quality. Of course, if you eat too much of it, that's maybe not good. They also make high fructose corn syrup, and they make obesity. Um, and just to remind you, two thirds of all Americans are overweight, and one third of all Americans are clinically obese, clinically obese. And that is a time bomb of medical cost and social catastrophe that terrifies the medical profession. And, um, and all of this is subsidized by the Department of Agriculture and the US government. OK, now in California, they do a lot better. They grow food, um, lots of food, lots of really good, lots of really nutritious food. Um, that's some sort of leafy green. That's strawberries. That's quite a strawberry field. And that's almonds, the much maligned almond. Um, and it's all pretty good and healthy. Um, except it does have a lot of pesticide in it. Uh, it's also far from markets. Did you know, did you know that something like 85% of all lettuce in the United States comes from the Salinas Valley in Northern California, the salad bowl of America? And two thirds of that stuff never gets eaten because it gets spoiled in the fields, it gets spoiled in transport, it gets spoiled in markets, and so about one third of it has a chance of being eaten. And it's transported across the country in trucks. 
which of course are using fossil fuels and blah, blah, blah. So there's high carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but I got to tell you, the organic markets in La Jolla, California are amazing. And that's 12 months out of the year. Um, no, it's gone to sleep again. Remind me in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. you. Other duties is assigned. <laughs> OK, onward and upward. The stupid thing is about is that there are very clear alternatives. Industrial, that's what that says at the top. Agriculture can be sustainable. We've known how to do this forever. Your tax dollars have paid for it. There are all these research institutions in the Midwest that can do it. Perennial crops and just plain old prairie yield almost as much biomass for biofuels, ethanol, as corn without any watering, without any fertilizer, and without any pesticides or any erosion, because you only mow it, you don't plow it. Perennial borders having you know, a little bit of vegetation along the sides of the fields, plus uh, catchments can reduce the runoff of nutrients and whatever pesticides are used or whatever by 90%, and they triple biodiversity. These are all the good things that happen with it. And you can see all the bad things that are also uh, prevented. I mean, these, there are hundreds of papers in the scientific literature with this stuff um, out there. Um, there's something, a place called the Rodale Institute, not that far away from here, that for way over 20 years has been demonstrating that you can grow organic crops that are as productive and make more money as conventional crops. And they publish the papers, and they keep it going. And this is my favorite thing. This is Aero Farms. Um, imagine an abandoned steel tubing factory in Newark, New Jersey, in the bad part of Newark, New Jersey, not where you think of good food coming from. And Aero Farms has converted it into this farm. It produces the equivalent of a 130-acre well-managed uh, farm, and it uses only a fraction of the water, no pesticide, and very little nutrient. We know how to do all this stuff. It's all possible there. None of the alternatives are subsidized. The other stuff is subsidized. The only impediment to sustainability in agriculture is the intense lobbying of Monsanto and all the other agribusiness corporations in bed with the Department of Agriculture who loves them to death. This is sort of like the overfishing problem in the US. Equally fixable, very fixable. It's just a matter of corruption. Now, this is a lot worse. The whole question of sea level rise and the disappearing Mississippi Delta, which is the icon of the problem of sea level rise. What you're looking at is an aerial photograph of the Mississippi Delta. And you know, God didn't make these straight lines, right? Oil and gas exploration made those straight lines. And what happens when you make a hole in a marsh on a delta, it's like a tumor. In fact, if you fly over the Mississippi Delta, which we did, it's like looking at a gigantic cancerous lung, where the tumors are the areas that, where the vegetation has been lost and have opened up. And they get bigger and bigger and bigger from erosion along the side until they disappear. And um, there's a air, famous set of aerial photographs that I took out because they're sort of dark and hard to see. But what they show, and there are many, many replicates of these, is that in 1950, you, you're looking down on a big area of the delta, sort of this big. And what you see is 90% land and 10% water. And by 2000, what you see is 10% land and 90% water. The delta is sinking four times faster than sea level is rising. It will be, it's sinking at the rate of a football field an hour. The delta will be gone in 50 years. And the southern coastline of Louisiana will be lapping up on Baton Rouge 
way north of New Orleans, which if it's still there, will be an island. So why is it happening? Uh, it's happening for three main reasons. The first is nutrient pollution from all that fertilizer in Iowa, which we didn't really need to use so much of, and which we could have prevented from going down the river, which weakens the roots of the marshes. Uh, weakens them so much that when storms come through, they get blown out. The second thing, which is um, doing it, uh, is, is, the, um, is the canals that I talked about. And the third is accelerating subsidence and sea level rise. So sea level rise is, I'll talk more about how much sea level is rising in, in the next slide. But so let's imagine the sea level rise is, is going at an inch a year, which it's not, but just as a simple thing to think about. The land in the delta is sinking four inches a year in comparison. So in other words, the delta is sinking five times faster than a place which isn't going down. And the reason for that is all deltas subside, but they are nourished by sediment that comes down the river that makes the delta. Well, we built a bunch of dams in North Dakota uh, on the upper Mississippi River that we didn't need, but the people who were building dams had run out of places to build dams. So they took away all the land from the indigenous people who had been moved there in the first place from where they wanted to live. <clears throat> and we built these dams. And we trapped, in the process, trapped all the sediment that used to go down the Mississippi River and nourish the delta. And it's sort of a mess. OK, now, look at this picture in the lower right. OK, and I'm going to come back to the one in the left in a minute. But look at the picture in the lower right. That's the famous cathedral in the French Quarter of New Orleans. What's wrong with that picture? Can you see the door of the church? No, you can't see the door. Why can't you see the door? Oh, the door is 15 feet below the level of the Mississippi River. That's what levees do. If you want to understand New Orleans, go to the Ninth Ward. Look down on the shipping line uh, channel, which was the hypodermic needle that shot water into the Ninth Ward and killed all those people instantaneously. Uh, it was there because of this structure called Mr. Go, uh, which was designed for shipping and, and actually killed those people in New Orleans. We spent billions building it. We're now, we just spent a billion to prevent it from killing people in the future. And so the river is flowing 15 feet above the city because the levees, you build a levee, and the water comes up because the bottom of the river comes up. So you build a levee a little harder, higher, and the river comes up a little bit more. And the net result of it, I mean, it's unbelievable. Just stand on that levee, look down on where all those people were drowned, and think about the insanity of it. And it was built with your taxpayers' dollars by the Army Corps of Engineers, which has a batting average of zero in New Orleans. OK. So this is from the NOAA website. And this is their latest projection of sea level rise. And I was very excited about it. You can see it really wasn't doing a lot for a long time. And then these are all the different scenarios. And the reason there are all these different scenarios is because, frankly, we don't know how much it's going to rise. And the reason we don't know, I'm going to tell you in a minute. But there's something revolutionary about this latest graph. And that is that they are showing the possibility, the low probability of a really huge increase in sea level rise. And that's because they are admitting in the projections for the first time the enormity of the uncertainty of Greenland and Antarctica in it all. And just, um, you, you know, so I'm an environmentalist. I'm a lefty. I'm totally untrustworthy. Zillow. You all know Zillow, right? I mean, they're the people who want to sell you a house for more than it's worth. Um, they did their own analysis. And they concluded, Zillow concluded, that by 2100, 300 cities would lose half their homes, 
30 of those cities would disappear, and one in eight Florida homes would be underwater. Do not move to Florida. Do not move to Florida. OK, and so here's the uncertainty. This is what, this is what Greenland looks like on the top. These, this is just one of the rivers on the surface of Greenland where the meltwater is just flowing down all the way to the bottom. Now look at this statistic. Between 1992 and 2001, there were 34 gigatons per year of ice melt. 34 millions of tons of ice melt. How do we know that? We've got these amazing radar from satellites, and we can measure the elevation of Greenland with a precision of a millimeter. OK? This is easy peasy now. We do it. Uh, some people want to stop those satellites from flying over Greenland and Antarctica. Did you know that? OK, so, so 34 gigatons between those 10 years, but between 2002 and 2011, it was 215 gigatons. It was 600% increase in the meltwater off of the top of Greenland in 10 years. And the next numbers that'll come, you know, when will that be? Uh, in 2021, 10 times more, 1,000% increase, 1,500% increase. It's just, we don't know. And I need you again. OK, OK, thank you. So, but it's so much fun to watch you come up here and do it. <laughs> OK, I took this picture from my, uh, with my iPhone, thank God for iPhones, uh, in an airplane while I was writing this book. I grew up, I went from fifth to twelfth grade in Coconut Grove about here. We lived in the highest place in Dade County, 13 feet above sea level. And we had two sinkholes on our property, these karst. And you know, when a uh, karst, uh, in, when a big area has dissolved away, the top will sometimes collapse. A poor guy in his house in northern Florida, his house and him and everything disappeared into a very big sinkhole. So we had two sinkholes, and I remember in, when I was 12 or 10 or whatever, in piddling Category 2 hurricanes, the rainwater that fell and accumulated in those sinkholes would move up and down with the storm surge from the ocean a mile away from the sinkhole because Florida's honeycomb limestone, you couldn't build one of those stupid levees like the Mississippi River in Florida because the water would go underneath. It's another reason you should not move to Florida. <laughs> OK, so this is Miami Beach. This is Miami. That's South Miami and whatever. This is all landfill. This is all landfill, landfill. When I was a kid, it was illegal for people to have houses out here because everybody knew it would be destroyed in a hurricane. But B.B. Ramoso and Dick Nixon fixed that. And so that you got this huge number of people who live out there connected by this causeway you cannot see. OK, and they tend to be a little arrogant, so they might think they were bigger than the hurricane until they were terrified, which would mean they'd all try and get off at the same time when it was too late. The last time there was a Category 5 hurricane that hit directly in Miami, um, there were about 100,000-ish people who lived there. And as I recall, there were close to 1,000 deaths. OK, now there are 5.5 million people who live there. Back then, people were really smart. They lived in the highest parts of Miami. Now they live in these places. Um, there is a plan for the permanent evacuation of Miami for people never to return. OK? The Defense Department has that plan. A Category 5 hurricane in that last Category 5 hurricane, water reached where Miami Airport is. That is way inland. The ocean reached Miami Airport. OK. And all these other cities, relocation is inevitable. 
this is a really good place to live. You're really high up. You've got the Hudson River. Um, New York is in much better shape, which I think is wonderful, uh, <laughs> since I just moved there again. That's where I'm from. But I think about Sandy. It costs $65 billion. Now, that's what they admit to. All the unclaimed stuff Sandy really cost uh, much more than $65 billion. It probably cost $200 billion. But who's counting? For $25 billion, the Dutch will build breakwater and barrier here, you know, and somewhere east of Lower LaGuardia, and buy 50 to 100 years for Lower Manhattan. Now, our governor and our mayor of New York don't get along. Uh, if they would stop acting like high school students or maybe elementary school students and get together to do something about this, why aren't we doing it? We are no better prepared, protected in New York today than we were when Sandy happened, because sea level is this much higher. And this, this is the Cadillac version. This is the Fiat version. We're doing a lot of the Fiat stuff that's being started. OK. But this is dealable with. It's hard. You have to give up where you live. You have to move. It costs a lot of money. On the other hand, Germany did really well after World War II when they rebuilt. And so maybe rebuilding is not such a bad thing. OK, here's the really bad stuff. OK, no, because, I mean, I gave this talk at Stony Brook two weeks ago. And somebody wrote me and said, the kids are ready to commit suicide. And I said, you know, we, weren't, we didn't give up in 1962 with Martin Luther King. And, and we didn't give up about the Vietnam War. And we didn't give up about women's rights. And what is this soundbite generation that if we don't solve the problem before we go to a Starbucks at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, that, oh my god, it's hopeless. But this stuff, this stuff is a lot more serious. And, and in the long term, we can do a lot about it. But we're going to have to live with it in a very serious way. So I, I love this map. I mean, you know, we're getting a whole lot more precipitation in the Northeast in extreme storms. Do you remember a few years ago, it rained like hell in Vermont? And towns were submerged. You know, I mean, yeah, or whatever. I wasn't here then. I was still in California. But it was one of those, yeah. And, and so there's this huge increase in very damaging precipitation. Um, we can solve this by building reservoirs. I mean, California, which is in drought, can capture that water. Remember, drought, California's in drought, 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 drought. Six months of flooding rains, incredible destruction. That dam almost burst. People had to flee, whatever. Oh, for billions and billions of dollars, California is very rich. Um, they can build reservoirs to hold that water and solve their problem. Uh, they're just going to have to build them. Maine is a very poor state. And we're really suffering from this. And we don't have the money to build all those reservoirs. So th these are big things. So there are all these stronger storms, flooding, and tornado. Extreme heat waves. Nancy and I were in France in 2003 during the famous chaleur in Western Europe. 35,000 Europeans died in that heat wave in August of 2003. The projection is that US heat deaths will equal or exceed all deaths in traffic accidents by 2,100 from heat. Uh, drought is really bad. That's like me. Like Powell looks the same. The reason it's white is because the water used to be there and it's not there anymore. And then I love this because I, I, I've never done anything in Phoenix except travel through it. And I always wonder about you know landing in an airplane. You have to get off to get on another pl plane. The air conditioners are pumping like mad in the jet bridge. And it's 100 degrees in the jet bridge. And it's 115 degrees outside the jet bridge. And they're going to have more than 150 days a year over 115 degrees in some time that far in the future. And I just love this. The Guardian, by the way, has the best environmental reporting of any 
standard newspaper. And you know, Phoenix, plight of Phoenix, how long can the world's least sustainable city survive? They still have golf courses. They still have fountains spewing water in the air. It's still legal to have a lawn. It isn't in New Mexico. You have to have native vegetation. So the, all of these cities are in extreme drought. Groundwater depletion in the West is something like 85% increased persistent drought by 2050, double previous levels. Phoenix has two years of groundwater. And, and if those lakes dry up or whatever, California has its first dibs on all the remaining water in those lakes. And Phoenix gets very sloppy last. OK, the North Atlantic hurricanes are, uh, are becoming a lot more common. Um, Carrie Emanuel, the brilliant climatologist at Woods Hole, MIT, wrote a paper with buddies projecting a trillion dollar in losses by 2100, 50 50 for relocation fortifications. And that number is way, way too low. He would say that. Um, and then we got the summer of 2017. I, I rewrote half of this book before it went to press in two, three months because Harvey, Irma, Maria, boom, 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 within a month, right? 3,000 to 4,000 people dead in Puerto Rico. Uh, Saipan just got erased. Um, the California firestorms. Firestorms that make their own weather. Flames that are up as high as you are two minutes after you took off in your airplane. That is what it looks like. I remember flying out of San Diego one time and looking out the window and seeing one, two, three fires coming. The cost of these things are huge. People are talking about the new normal. Uh-uh. The new normal is the accelerating rate of getting worse. It's not going to just be like now. This is not the new normal. The only thing about the new normal is that it will keep getting worse and maybe faster until it reaches some equilibrium. Restart now. <laughs> Postpone. Yeah, success. OK. And, okay. and so this is recent events, right? So I'm going to move over here. This is Hurricane Michael. It was a piddling tropical depression here. Now, you know, the power of prediction is a very important thing. Scientists 20 years ago said, hurricanes are heat engines. They're a device by which the Earth cools itself. If a tropical depression encounters very hot water, it must intensify because that's how it works. OK. So this thing is piddling along, coming up from the Caribbean. It starts to hit hot water. What is this map showing? This is showing a temperature anomaly. So the red, you're getting to 4 degrees centigrade, 7 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than normal. The Gulf of Maine this summer was 7 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than it had been before. OK. So it's tropical depression, tropical depression category one, two, three, four, boom. Hurricane Harvey, middling tropical depression, meandering up, runs into a pool of hot water. Houston is screwed. Florence coming in up there was sort of a, it hit, you know, it died down, but it intensified and picked up all that water because it hit hot water somewhere out here. OK, now let's think about Hurricane Michael. You've seen the photographs. It erased Mexico City, Florida, right? Pavement. What would happen if it had hit here? OK, what really drives me nuts, why I wrote this book, is that we, there's so much we know how to do already. 
We know how to do it. We can do it. People are already doing it. So unsubsidized wind and solar are already cheaper than subsidized fossil fuels. You all know that the oil and gas industry is heavily subsidized, right? Exxon really needs your taxpayer dollars. We are switching over now at accelerating rates. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Denmark, Germany, Italy, it said they already get a quarter to 40% of their electricity from wind. And cities in Texas are getting nearly 100% of their electricity from the wind. And you know, the naysayers say, well, you know, the sun doesn't shine at night, and sometimes the wind doesn't blow. But battery technology, and we have crazy man Elon Musk to thank for a lot of this. Battery technology is moving at light speed for the downtimes. And also, as, as I learned last night, um, it's possible to use uh, responsible biofuels to kick in at night as well. Um, all of these things we know how to do. All of these things are happening in places. Um, if you produce electricity where you need it, I don't know where your electricity is generated, but on the train I saw this gigantic transfer station. So wherever it was produced, let's say they made a kilowatt of electricity, by the time it got to your house, half to two-thirds of it had disappeared as heat into the atmosphere. Dumb, right? If you use solar and wind and you make the electricity next to the consumer, Funny thing, you don't waste all that electricity. The other thing, as we heard in this very inspiring talk last night from a man uh, from Puerto Rico who rescued communities with solar panels, what, ha what happened in Puerto Rico? Not only did the plant get broken, but all the transmission lines were down. You don't need that when you have solar. Okay, greater energy efficiencies, all cars, Norway is going to be all electric cars, sort of ironic, they have a lot of oil, but they're going to be all electric cars in a few years. The, and this is just like agriculture. The only thing that is holding us back from all of this is the fossil fuel industry and their buddies. And we all know who they are. And Nancy told me not to be political, but it doesn't take a genius to think about that. Okay. There are huge major commitments, especially in the People's Republic of California. <laughs> San Diego, which was one of the birthplaces of the John Birch Society, the mayor, who is Republican, got together with the Democratic City Council, and they passed a law and said, San Diego is going to be 100% clean energy by 2035, period. They're working at it. When San Diego Gas and Electric dragged its feet in making the conversion, they said, screw you, the city of San Diego, I just read about this in the newspaper two days ago, city of San Diego is going in the electric power business, and it's going to produce only renewable energy, and it's going to sell it to anybody who wants it in San Diego, period, because they got fed up with SDG&E. I think that's amazing. And then, of course, in California, they've already invested billions of dollars. You can't build a new house in California without putting solar panels on it, period. You cannot do it. OK, and then, of course, Brown, the flower child governor. I mean, talk about a renaissance in a career. I mean, he should be you know, perpetuated forever because he is an extraordinary governor for California. And he just signed this law that says, California must be 100% renewable by 2045, period. And they're going to do it. They might not quite get there, but they're doing it. New York can do that. OK, and then a company, XL Energy, did a little product testing, discovered that they could save a whole lot of money if they increase their solar and wind capacity. And they have now announced, committed themselves to produce 50% of all their electricity by the 2020s um, from wind and solar. 
They provide electricity to eight Midwestern states. They are a mega utility, and they're doing it for the bottom line. Okay, this is my last slide. I mean, the political winds can change, and we can get back to really trying and really working at it, but there still is the question, how fast can we do it? And I painted a sort of rosy picture. There are a lot of technical challenges. The battery thing is coming around, but there are challenges. So how fast can we do it? This should be like, you know, the Victory in Europe program. This should be like Liberty Ships. Remember? How many people are in this room? I remember my parents telling me about Liberty Ships. Okay, how much more extreme weather and sea level rise is already locked into the system? The reason sea level rise is scary as hell is because there's this latent heat increase in the Earth, and it's not going to go away. We can make it be less. We can do enormous good by really moving rapidly, but it's sort of an open question whether or not we can stabilize Antarctica and stabilize Greenland. We should be trying like hell because Antarctica has got 70 meters of sea level rise, 200 feet. That's, that's all the coastal cities of the United States. It'll be a long time coming. We have lots of time, but it would be really nice if it, we only had, let's say, 20 feet of sea level rise or 15 feet of sea level rise and had it happen slowly so that we could adapt and whatever. And then I guess the scariest thing, um, I, I couldn't fit the picture in, but there was this great article in The Guardian three days ago, the head of the International Red Cross announced that beyond a shadow of a doubt, they are ascribing the explosions in conflict around the world to climate change. That, that it's just obvious to him that that is the greatest driving factor in climate. So how much can we modulate global climate? I spent a lot of time at the Naval War College where I'm very happy to report that the military are data-driven and therefore they understand climate change and they're thinking about it. And the Navy, of course, is very worried about the fact that all of their naval bases are gonna be underwater and they're gonna to have to respond to that. So, and then finally, how massively can we scrub out atmospheric carbon dioxide? Um, there should be a billion dollar prize to the person who figures out how to suck it out because the one thing it could make some of the gloomier things I've said be much more positive is if we could wave our magic wand and take the carbon dioxide out and put it in a very safe box and leave it there. Because uh, that's what, uh-huh, restart now. <laughs> okay. So I leave you with that and just to say, um, that's the book, and that's my co-author, and he's standing on the Mississippi River at Lake Itasca, where you can walk across the Mississippi River by stepping on stones. Thank you very much. So we're going to take some questions. We're going to have a couple mics going around. When you get the mic, there will be somebody ahead of you. By definition, when you get it, somebody else is asking the question. So be patient and then ask your question. There's a, a new book out uh, called Farewell to Ice. A new book out called Farewell to Ice but Ice by the Oxford University Press. Can, can you hear me? Oh, okay. A new book out called A Farewell to Ice. And I think, it, as if you're not scary enough, the author is talking about methane as being an issue that we really need to be very concerned about. Would you Meth comment? Methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, the good news is there's a lot less methane than carbon dioxide, but then we don't really know that because we know there's a lot of methane trapped in permafrost, and, and there are even things called methane hydrates where methane is, 
is, is a solid. Um, yeah, methane is scary. Um, but the upper limit of it all is the amount of ice that's, that exists on the surface of the Earth. And um, the great mass of fresh water in the Earth is in Greenland and Antarctica. And we know what that volume is. So that's our upper limit for sea level rise. We just don't want that, obviously. And so we just need to work to, to min we know there's going to be a lot of melt. We know it's going to be a big problem. But we want that problem to be as small and manageable as possible. And I think we can do that. Um, it's just a matter. But every day that goes by, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, we're killing people. Every day we're not doing this. We are killing people on this planet. Are there any real prospects for improvements due to geoengineering, or is that just fantasy land at this point? Uh, the question was about geoengineering. Um, there's some crazy engineering, and there's some engineering, geoengineering, which is not totally crazy, um, that humanity might use in desperation. The crazy stuff is putting iron filings in the ocean and changing productivity and getting stuff, carbon dioxide, to be taken out of the system and deposited. And there are all sorts of risks associated with that. And it's not clear how much it would do. But there was the summer, the year when there was no summer. It was when there was an enormous, I forget which of the incredible volcanic eruptions in Indonesia or the Philippines it was, something that would make Pinatubo look like, you know, a little bleak. <laughs> and all that volcanic dust got in the atmosphere. And there was no summer. Crops failed in Europe and in New England. Um, it was dark. And um, it was cold. Um, so. I suppose if we got really, really desperate, meaning that people are starting to die like flies and everything, we'd shoot some sort of um, salt into the atmosphere that would have that kind of effect. Um, but nobody but crazies wants to do that now. I mean, that's a last resort. And then, you know, we are a society that thinks technology will fix everything. So you tell people that there's something that we could do that would magically make it better, and then we'll just keep buying SUVs and doing all that. I mean, those cars have to be illegal. All cars in 20 years must be electric. Um, there has to be a tax on, on how much energy you use. Um, what I didn't talk about, which I think is the most interesting and intellectually exciting thing is how does society assume responsibility generally for everybody? Because this is also an equi equity, equitability, I can never say that word issue. It's a social justice issue. The 20 countries that are going to disappear in one or two decades underwater in the Pacific because of sea level rise we caused. The people whose homes are destroyed by these hurricanes, you know, in poor areas like the panhandle of Florida. And if that hurricane happens, no, when the Category 5 hits Miami, there will be five or six million climate refugees. Where are they going to go in the richest country in the world? I mean, the people who fly out in their private jets will be fine, but the Millions of retirees, who every penny they have is tied up in their house, which is then destroyed or underwater. There's no fresh water. Who's going to take care of those people? I mean, that is an enormous social equity issue. And we have to rise to deal with that as a society. And the cost of something like that rivals or maybe exceeds the cost of the depression in terms of social welfare. So these are really gritty issues. And I personally believe that if we would confront these as humanitarian issues, it would sink in just how dangerous this is and maybe could result in some more
profound commitment to make those little stupid sacrifices we're all resisting making. Is there another? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this uh, extremely insightful presentation. I, I'm still trying to assimilate both the level of alarm that we should realistically feel as well as some of the optimism that you pointed to. My question has to do with possible impediments to sustainability uh, that have to do with the role of the environmental NGOs, and I'm thinking about the largest and most popular of them that are heavily dependent on donations from the fossil fuel industry and from outfits like Dow and Monsanto and I'm, you know, Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, and so forth. And so they tend to do these partnering arrangements with some of the same culprits to which you have called attention. And what, if anything, can be done by those of us in academia and in uh, ecological research to address that problem of getting environmental NGOs to really be guardians and protectors of the environment instead of being guardians and protectors of the culprits? Well, I don't think they're that. I think it's a very complicated issue. I, I was on the National Board of the World Wildlife Fund for seven years, and, and we parted friendly, but it wasn't my cup of tea. And part of what I didn't like is what you're referring to. Um, but I can also, I'll only speak for WWF because it's the one I know something about. They um, worked very hard to make their partnerships be positive. Um, so, for example, they pioneered the sustainable forestry program, which um, is by and large a pretty big success. And, and they got um, one of their industrial partners is Anderson Windows. And Anderson Windows was the first company to genuinely commit itself to only using wood that was certified from that program. So those are the success stories. On the other hand, they tried to do the same thing for fisheries, and let me tell you, it's a scam. I mean, the so-called, uh, uh, God, what is that thing called? Uh, marine, it's, it's marine Stewardship Council. Uh, I mean, they're, they're a growth industry. They have to sustain fisheries to survive, and they sustained in our prill when we didn't even know the life cycle of Antarctic krill. I mean, it's just, it's awful. Um, but um, Josh and Nancy and I were talking about that earlier this afternoon. It, it's, I suppose it depends on the strength of the administrator of the, I, I, I would venture the Nature Conservancy hasn't sold its soul to the devil, that it's taken the money, but it does what it wants. Uh, on the other hand, there is a great book, which is 20 years old, um, titled uh, Losing Ground, about the sort of corporatization of the bingos, the big uh, NGOs, which I think everybody should read um, who's interested in the topic. It was written by Mark Dowie, who's a wonderful journalist. He was one of the founding people at Mother Jones and whatever. Um, but the good news is that um, the handwriting's on the wall and smart business is moving on its own accord, motivated by the profit motive. That's the tragedy of the current administration. Um, and remember, even the head of Exxon begged the president not to withdraw from the Paris Accords. And they're investing very heavily. I mean, they're, in my opinion, cynical bastards, and they're going to you know, pump as much oil as they possibly can for as much profit as they can. And they know it's just a racing game, and then it's going to end. Well, we got to stop it sooner. Um, and there are ways to stop it sooner. But even they know that their time is numbered. And, and uh, for example, there was a meeting at Yale convened by John Kerry, the former Secretary of State, attended by Michael Bloomberg, attended by um, James Baker, who was Secretary of State for both Bushes, uh, you know, knows the Saudi kingdom by first name. And they all got together and said, one, 
um, the president doesn't know what he's talking about. Two, this is an enormous threat to America's future and prosperity and global leadership. And three, we can fix this problem for $350 billion a year, and that's pocket change. And so they are actually committed to doing this. I have, it's sort of hard to follow, but they don't exactly tell you what they're doing, right? Um, but it was really interesting, and there was a report, and one of the statements was, we can make a million new jobs. So, so the highest paying job in the Midwest right now is windmill technician, new job. And in North Dakota, which is probably going to unelect its wonderful senator, um, wind energy is growing while fracking is declining. So I, those are the kinds of things that make me hopeful. You know, know thine enemy, but um, the friend of my enemy is my friend, right? I, the enemy of my friend is my friend. So, uh, or I said it wrong both times, but you know what I mean. While you're looking that up, it's the... Hey, I don't know. If, are we done? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. I, is, if there aren't any more, I just want to read you one last thing because I forgot, and I think it's a good way to end. Um, this is at the beginning of the epilogue of the book. We are like tenant farmers chopping down the fence around our house for fuel when we should be using nature's inexhaustible sources of energy, sun, wind, and tide. I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. Thomas Edison to Henry Ford, 1931. Thank you all. <laughs>